Hi, Joshua. Hi, Bob. How you doing? I'm doing well. Good. Thank you for joining us. Let me introduce us. Uh, first of all, this is an episode of Worldwise. I'm Robert Wright of Blogging Heads TV. You are Joshua Landis, noted authority authority on Syria. We hear you on NPR and so on. Um, you're at the University of Oklahoma, and you were the author of the Syria Comment blog. Yes, indeed. Um, and I'm afraid we're here to talk Syria, but I say I'm afraid because I don't think there's anything cheerful to say about that subject. It's, if anything, gotten grimmer since we spoke a few months ago, probably. Um, I glanced uh, at your blog right before we started taping, and you were talking about a scorched earth policy that the regime seemed headed toward and the possibility of ethnic cleansing in a, in a crucial place that I'm going to mispronounce called Latakia or La... Yeah, that's it. Uh -huh. Latakia is on the coast. It's the capital uh, of what is the Alawite Mountains and the Alawite province. The Alawites, who are about 2.5 million of Syria's 2.3, uh, 23 million people, about 11%, 12%, live, they're a compact minority. They live mostly on the coast. Think of the Lebanese, just north of the Lebanese, along the mount, same mountain range that goes up through Lebanon, and uh, it continues up towards Turkey. And they are sprinkled in those mountains. The, the problem is the coastal cities, there's some big coastal cities, Latakia, Jebli, Benyas, Tartus, those are traditionally Sunni cities. And in the 1920s, when the French first arrived there to take it as a colony or a mandate, uh, there was stark demographic segregation. The Alawites lived in the mountains, the Sunnis lived in the cities and on the plains. Mm -hmm. And that's the same for the minorities up and down. The Druze live in mountains, the Maronites live in mountains. All the minorities lived in mountains, theoretically for their safety and, so, and because they didn't get along with the Sunnis. Now, with modern national states being created after the fall of the Ottoman Empire, these minorities have come out of the mountains and they've spread into the cities. But their cohabitation is fairly new. Mm -hmm. The laws that say that they're equal are new. And there is still, even though it's 90, 80 years on, there is still, though, a lot of difference, a difference that isn't perceptible if you're just a tourist swanning around. But once you live there for a while, you realize there are deep prejudices and there are, well, there are deep prejudices that can be exacerbated in a, in a, in a wartime situation when one group begins persecuting another group. Mm -hmm. And so the Alawites are afraid of being wiped out, right? If the, uh, as they seem increasingly to be on the losing end of this war. Uh, yes, they do. And, you know, there's, it's becoming a self, I mean, everybody wants to cast blame in this situation. And, and the Alawites deserve a lot of blame for where we are today. Because the regime, in order to stay in power, cast this uprising, this popular uprising, as an Islamist, Al-Qaeda-inspired, foreign-animated uh, insurgency. Mm -hmm. And they have, in a sense, there's a lot of, they have created their own worst enemy. Because as a situation, as they've shot people and tried to repress the, the, this Sunni uprising, the sectarian hatreds have expanded. Now, there is, of course, a basis for their anxiety, uh, which is that they were discriminated against historically. Mm -hmm. And still today, in you know, the, the third article of the Constitution says the president has to be a Muslim. Now, Alawites are legally considered Muslims, but in part, but that's a delicate, unhappy recognition because theological sources have never recognized the Alawites as Muslims. They've always been recognized as Hudu, as exaggerators who are beyond the pale. They would like they like to think of themselves as Muslims, though, the, the way Mormons consider themselves Christians? Absolutely. They think of themselves as the best Muslims, who have the secret knowledge and uh, interpret the book in the right way, and, and in the same way that Mormons would say that they're the true people of God. And, you know, every religion. We're all the best... We're all chosen people. Right. So every religion arrogates themselves the chosenness and that God is looking after them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it wouldn't be a religion unless it did that. I guess that's the sort of first principle of any religion. So 
yes, the Alawites do see themselves as the best Muslims, but they are beyond the pale. Mm -hmm. In much the same way that a Mormon would be beyond the pale to an evangelical, because they add a book and they add a prophet, and it's just too much mm -hmm. for the mainstream to bear. And this creates a problem, because when the Sunnis say they want an Islamic state, what they're you know, what this means to an Alawite is we're going to go back to the old days when we were not allowed to testify in, in, in a court of the land mm -hmm. uh, by law because they are not cons they're considered to be liars. Because they're not people of the book, um, they isn't, can't testify. Isn't that almost the best case scenario? I mean, don't a lot of Alawites fear that they'll actually be exterminated or not? Well, they've, this is the situation that's been created today is that because of the... Uh, this disorganization and the collapse of the state and the rise of all these militias and sectarian anger and hatred, there is a possibility of ethnic cleansing. And I mean, that's what happened to the Christians in Turkey between 1914 and 1922, when Turkey had their revolution, their nationalist revolution, if you will, with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Almost 20% of Anatolia was Christian, 18%. And by 1922, it was less than 1%. That's because the Armenians, about a million and a half Armenians were killed and many others fled. Mm -hmm. And the Orthodox Christians, there was a big population transfer to Greece, and the Greece sent about, oh, 800,000 Muslim, Greek Muslims packing to Anatolia, and Anatolia kicked out a million and a half Greek Orthodox. Now, many of those Greek Orthodox fled to Syria, so many of Syria's Christians are Anatolians originally. But... Mm -hmm. That, you know, you can't say it hasn't happened right. in the region. And we've seen Palestinians, you know, get, in a sense, moved out uh, as Jews have taken over Palestine. Mm -hmm. And so ethnic cleansing, you know, is not foreign to the region. It's not foreign to Eastern Europe. We've seen it in Yugoslavia. We've seen it in Czechoslovakia and Poland, you know, all throughout the old Eastern European countries where people were, all the ethnic groups were so mixed together. Mm -hmm. In many ways, the long 30 years war of 1914 to 45 was a, was a sorting out. And uh, ethnic cleansing was on the cards to create these new nation states. Right. So I guess there's kinds of two questions, right? I mean, there's the questions about the Alawite people, broadly speaking, and whether they will see themselves as having a place in a future kind of post-Civil War Syria and can be granted, guaranteed one. And then there's the question of the regime, because even if, you know, the, the Alawites might be treated decently, uh, if I were in the regime, I would think uh, I'm going to get killed regardless. Right. I mean, and, and and so one question is, is there a way out at this point for the regime? Is there any kind of accommodation that could make, you know, something like surrender seem preferable to the regime to the scorched earth policy you describe of just kind of bombing everything that moves? Well, you know, it could. It could, but I, it's not anywhere near. Because Assad still believes that he can retain Damascus. And he's not going to leave Damascus until he's been pushed out militarily. Now, that day will come, I believe. I think it's further away than most of us how, think. How far away do you think it is? Well, a lot of, you know, a lot of policy people have been saying by summer, Assad's going to be gone. And if you look at, you know, the Wall Street trading figures as a site where you can bet on how long Assad's going to live, the vast majority of people are betting on him being gone by the summertime. Mm -hmm. Now, being dead? Well, they don't say that. They dead just or gone. no longer be president of yeah, Syria, yeah, okay. whatever the hell that means. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a big difference, and I don't think most people are thinking about this. I mean, he could be driven out of Damascus, but he's in charge of the biggest army in Syria, mm -hmm. Syria. Army, and that's the Syrian army, and that's become, over time, it's becoming an Alawite militia. There's still quite a few Sunnis who fight for it, but increasingly, once if it gets driven out of Damascus, there's going to be less and fewer and fewer, and it's become an Alawite-dominated militia. Now, if that backs up to the Alawite mountains and takes refuge in the mountains, as is the Alawites have done historically, and try to make that their stand, it's going to be very difficult for the Sunnis to overcome them in the mountains. Hmm. because they'll have a social base there, much like Hezbollah in southern Lebanon or the Christians hmm. in northern Lebanon, so forth. Now, you could overrun them, but you'd still have 2.5 million Alawites to contend with, and theoretically, there are, most of them are armed, and they're going to fight. And the Alawites are highly militarized. 
they've been in the army overwhelmingly. They're trained, they've got a command and control. So even if Assad loses Damascus, he could remain the most powerful militia in Syria, mm -hmm. where warlordism could flourish. Everything depends on two variables. One is, does Iran continue to back the Alawites? Two, do the Sunni Arabs, which make up 70% of the population of Syria, become unified? If they can unify and develop one military with a command structure, they could easily put paid to the Alawites, no matter what the Alawites do. If they fight over Syria, which looks increasingly likely, and that there are a lot of militias who don't want to give up authority, then you could have warlordism, and it would be like Lebanon, and there would be lots of militias fighting, and, and Assad and the Alawites could remain one of the most powerful militia on the coast. And that, now, to get a negotiated outcome, let's say you get down to that point in a year's time or whatever it is, in order for negotiations to take place, it would seem clearly the Assad family needs to move on. Mm-hmm. It would be easier, let's say, to carry out those negotiations. It doesn't have to happen, obviously. Uh, in Lebanon, we have warlords like Jean Blatt and Jaja ja and so forth, all of whom were responsible for killing tens of thousands of Lebanese and who survived because they had a militia and that's the way it was. Now, the Assads could survive and even Bashar al-Assad could survive, but it will be very difficult for these militias to sit down and negotiate with him. Until they're out of the country or dead? Yes, until they're... You know, somehow the Alawites have found a new leadership. The trouble is the Alawites are not going to be able to find a new leadership easily. Either the, Al the Assads have to volunteer to leave and leave behind some alternative Alawite leadership that mm -hmm. could then negotiate with the Sunnis from a position of saying, well, we got rid of those evil guys and we're the good Alawites. Or, but it's very hard for them to do that because the Assads rule the Alawites in the same way that they ruled Syria which is by eliminating any possible alternative. Mm -hmm. And they have done that inside Alawite Al Al society. And, you know, you look at the Shabiha, who are really ruling the Rus today in Syria, all of them are relatives of Assad. Mm -hmm. They are there because of their loyalty. That's why they're Shabiha, and they have guns, and they're powerful. Okay. So you're pessimistic on both sides of the equation, in, in the sense that, on the one hand, <clears throat> you don't imagine... Um, the Assad family vacating, which you see as a kind of a prerequisite for negotiation. On the other hand, on the other side, the, the, the Sunnis, you don't see enough unity forming to, to lead to kind of bipartisan negotiations uh, or bilateral negotiations in the, in the first place. I mean, there is this, what is it, the Syrian National Coalition is the new a group that is supposedly cohesive enough to command recognition from various Western entities, but you, you don't, you know, they had this meeting, what, a few weeks ago and said, okay, we're new and improved, now we're unified. You don't, you don't take that very seriously? Not yet. I mean, America normally, U.S. government normally only recognizes another government if it controls territory mm -hmm. and it, it has a, almost a monopoly on the use of force within that territory. This new group, the National Coalition, Syrian Opposition Coalition, does not have that. Uh, this is aspirational on the part of the United States, but what else can they do? They need to get the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. They're terrified of Al-Qaeda getting ensconced in Syria, and they're trying to promote their friends and hurt their enemies. Yeah, but on that, on that note, aren't we defining one of the constituents of this coalition as a terrorist group? Isn't, isn't that the American position, or am I wrong? Yes, that's the we have we have named and prescribed Jabhat al-Nusra, the the Victory Front, uh, as a terrorist organization, mm -hmm. and they are the hardest hitting, the most best trained, and the most well organized uh, militia on the ground in Syria today. So. In some ways, we're chopping off or trying to chop off the opposition at the knees, even as we put on this rather powerless civilian leadership on top, which would be good for America because they are more secular, they're better educated, they're more America-loving, they're less Israel-opposing, 
than anybody else. So for American foreign policy, this would be you know a dream come true if we could get them to graft them on top of this rather Hobbesian military world down there in Syria. The chances of that working today seem not very powerful, but it depends. If America wants to give them weapons and money and really back them up, uh, they could gain a lot of leverage, but it's not clear that America is going to do that. It would also make it much easier to come to a negotiated settlement if they do gain leverage, because then, you know, ultimately the Alawites, in order to lay down their arms, are going to have to be reassured yeah. that they're not going to get killed <clears throat> and that they're going to be protected and that whatever the negotiated settlement is, is going to be honored. Mm -hmm. And in order to reassure them of that, there is going to have to be a centralized opposition leadership okay. that, that has some credibility to be able to protect them. But at the yeah. same time, if you've got an American-backed group that's kind of grafted on top, don't they immediately face legitimacy questions? Yes, of course they do. And that, that, that could, I mean, that's kind of a polite term for what they could eventually face, right? It is true. America is, uh, you know, everybody hates America. Everybody distrusts America deeply. And, and, and the Syrians distrust Americans in spades, not only because they've been living under a Ba'athist government, which has told them that America is an imperialist, cunning, but because they've seen America talk the talk in this revolution of anti-Assadism, mm -hmm. but do nothing. And even more than that, prescribe the most powerful militia in the opposition. So America has, in a sense, taken a default position, which is to prefer the status quo in Syria today, which is civil war. We're, we don't like Assad, we're committed to his downfall, but we're even more terrified of the opposition and the possibility that chemical weapons and Assad's arms would fall into the hands of Al-Qaeda and other Islamist groups that would use them to destabilize the rest of the Middle East. So America is not allowing good weapons to fall into the hands of the opposition, which they need to get rid of. We're, we're actively preventing it? Yes, we are. I mean, shoulder to air, you know, shoulder held, ground to air missiles. We have tried to keep them out of the hands of the rebels. Good anti-tank missiles. We don't want them to have those because we're frightened of what, you know, if they could get into the hands of the wrong people and bring down, you know, 747s full of Americans. But doesn't like Turkey want them to, I mean, doesn't Turkey want this thing to end as soon as possible, for example? No. Saudi Arabia, wouldn't they like the rebels to have this stuff? They would, and, and theoretically, we believe that Qatar gave quite a few of these things to the rebels, which have already brought down helicopters and planes, and we've seen them out there in use on videos. But all you know, all of the articles say that America is trying to put their foot on this and restrain Qatar and Saudi Arabia from arming these people because of the anxiety about this. And clearly, you know, the rebels could have done a lot more damage to Assad by this time had they had proper arms. And America just has been standing in the way of this. So in a sense, America is helping Assad. I mean, that's the way it looks to the Syrian fighter on the ground, mm -hmm. that America is double dealing in this and is saying one thing, but is doing something quite different. And that is not a recipe for uh, winning. The hearts and minds. The hearts and minds. Um, we, we seem bad at winning hearts and minds. <laughs> well, they're up against a very bad situation. I mean, there is not a good, for America, there isn't, you know, outcomes all look bad. And, and what we have today is a president who's trying to cover his derriere and not be responsible for what happened in Afghanistan, for example, when we did arm the Mujahideen and ended up with Al-Qaeda. That is a cautionary tale. Nobody wants to do that and have that blamed on them. It would ruin the presidency of anybody if that happened. Yeah. Um, now, you at one time, I think uh, this was this was a long, maybe as much as a year ago, I think, uh, were suggesting that, you know, you said on the one hand, the opposition is nowhere near ready to govern Syria. On the other hand, maybe as time goes on, if this civil war, you know, if it kind of simmers as time goes on, uh, something might congeal. The, 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 the opposition might mature into something that was ready to take possession of Syria. I gather that has not happened. It hasn't happened, but we've seen indications. There is just, at the same time that America was recognizing this, um, this opposition coalition, it helped broker 
the announcement of a military command made up of 22 different militia heads that said that they were moderate, they weren't you know, fundamentalist Islamists, they're Islamic light guys who would respect human rights. They made all the right noises. They sat in a room together. American officials were in the room behind them, evidently. And, uh, and that, you know, so we have a civilian leadership that's been recognized by the international community, a military leadership that at least came together to make the right words. Al-Nusra front is prescribed. So at least on paper, this is coming together. The problem is that on the ground, things are getting worse. And they're getting worse because poor Syria has no food. Uh, distribution has collapsed. Heating oil. We're going to winter with no bread. They're, on the coast, in certain regions, there are there is food where the, where the military situation hasn't gotten out of hand. But in places around Aleppo, Mm -hmm. And in the East, there's no transportation. There's real deprivation. People are starving. Kids are malnourished. And there's tons of refugees being spit out of Syria. Mm -hmm. And in that kind of environment, you're just getting criminality. Mm -hmm. Warlordism is going to go through the roof. Now, it does seem to me that if, if the administration would like the rebels to win sooner rather than later, if that's the case, but is just afraid of leaving them with weapons that we fear being in their hands subsequently, there would be a case for creating a no-fly zone, using NATO aircraft to do what those 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 shoulder-fired anti-aircraft things and various anti-aircraft stuff could do, but not giving them any weapons, right? Well, but I don't think the military, U.S. military, w does not want to sign on to that. Right. You know, I... Uh, I've talked to a lot of military officers in the last month, um, and all of them are trying to stay out of Syria. They do not want. So I think the military has got their foot on the brakes. Now, it's, Obama could drag them in there. They can do it. Mm -hmm. But Obama doesn't want to do it. It looks like whatever Secretary of State he's going to appoint is not going to want to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, he wants to fix our economy and balance our budget. The way to do that is not to get heavily involved in Syria. And uh, now he could do more in Syria, but the thing is, mission creep is always the problem. Right. Once you do a no fly zone, why don't you just kill Assad? You know, otherwise, you're just flying over this country and people are getting killed. And that's what we saw in Libya. A no fly zone turned into a no Qaddafi zone within two days, and we were out hunting him. Right. And you need to bring down the regime in order for your planes to go home. And uh, that's what it'll be in Syria. And it would make sense if you do that, then you need to go and blow up Assad's military and try to kill him and bring the thing to a conclusion. Which you could do. The, but, but, but a problem is that, uh, you know, it, it's not clear that you wind up uh, having much influence with the opposition, which is the new government of Syria, or that it has much unity or anything else. And the worst case scenario would be that these opposition groups all take the chemical weapons mm -hmm. and there are, there are hundreds of militias. They would be, you know, whoever got there first would take them. Uh, and you could have ethnic cleansing of the Alawites or other people or just real criminality like you had in Iraq where every piece of copper would be ripped out of the telephone poles and sold in the black market. And Syria would collapse into this Hobbesian world, and who would be left to take charge of it? You broke it. You destroyed whatever was left of the central state there. America would need to step in and assert some authority if things really started to go wrong. And that's, that's the, I think, that constant worry about what could go wrong mm -hmm. is what really and Are there no nearby nations that are positioned to, to play... Uh, the role of highly influential patron? In other words, if the U.S. just gave up on our really being able to control things, is it possible that Qatar or Saudi Arabia, I mean, I guess, I doubt Turkey since it's not an Arab country, but is there... A Turkey is a logical country. Is it? Turkey is a big country. It's got a big army. It's got a 530-mile border with Syria. It's got the longest border with Syria. It is right there and there's tons of refugees so turkey has an incentive to try to get this done the mm -hmm. trouble is that erdogan has gotten into a lot of trouble by being precipitous and to in taking the lead in this situation and he's realized a little bit like the roadrunner 
over the cliff. You know, his legs are spinning around, and he's realizing nobody is here to save me. I don't have any ground underneath me. And he could get lost. Syria could turn into his Vietnam. So he has been, he has been in reverse, mm -hmm. trying to disentangle himself a little bit because he knows that America and others are not going to jump in behind him. He's going to be left alone. But if we... I mean, if we backed him financially, I mean, if we said, okay, whatever weapons it takes, you know, you're in charge. It's not about the weapons. He could, his military, his Air Force could wipe out Assad probably fairly quickly. Really? But then you're left. What are you left with? That's the problem. The problem is the opposition is so undependable right. that it might end up into a civil war. So, so, so the answer to my first question, is there a neighboring country that has enough kind of on-the-ground knowledge, local knowledge, local influence to wield this into a cohesive uh, successor government, to, you know, to turn the rebel movement into that? The answer is it's not clear that any of the neighboring countries could do a better job than we could do. No, it isn't clear. And, and Saudi Arabia and Qatar have the money, but America doesn't like the people they would support. Um, and, and you, can't, you can't be too picky in these. <laughs> you cannot be too picky. You're absolutely right, and and we haven't been. And but increasingly, as Syria has become more Islamized and the militias have become more Islamic, and the Salafism has grown as a percentage of the militias, America's started to blame it on the Gulf. Now we can blame it on the fact that we didn't go in earlier, and that that you know the situation has gotten more radicalized. But it's also raised the same worries that about Afghanistan and other places that that we are so ideologically different. Right, but I mean, in terms of us being dissatisfied with with the kind of clients that that Qatar or Saudi Arabia might choose, neither Qatar nor Saudi Arabia, I believe, wants to see true out of control jihadists. Well, they do not. You know, they have an interest in regional stability, and and the real jihadists of the world would depose their governments before they would depose ours. So, uh, you know, what? That's a default mode. I mean, it is the default mode. The default mode is the Muslim Brotherhood. The trouble is, the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria is very weak mm -hmm. because Assad smashed it. Unlike Egypt, or even Tunisia, uh, but unlike Egypt, which is a good example, where it the Muslim Brotherhood was left to run in elections. It could never win because Mubarak wouldn't allow it to win. But it had a national network of people that were in every neighborhood, that had started schools, that were helping people, that would raise money. They had a real institutional framework. Mm -hmm. And this was a boon to Egypt because when it was time for revolution, the Muslim Brotherhood, hate them or love them, whatever your attitude was, could step into the breach and could take charge of government, come up with a constitution, and, and begin to move the ball forward. Right. In Syria, there isn't that kind of a party. The Muslim Brotherhood is racing to try to rebuild itself. But it has very little network built up inside Syria, and it's competing with lots of different interests. So it's very hard to find a party, because Assad didn't allow for any parties. It was a single-party state, and it, the place was a desert, politically. Right. So it's it's more like Iraq, and in Iraq we had to. It, it was only our having this huge on the ground presence and being very hands on about who got to govern and who didn't that wound up have, leaving even the degree of stability you have there now, which is not total. Absolutely, and it, you know, it was the United States. I mean, the, the Iraq model is is I think very apt. But what the United States did with boots on the ground was not only to destroy the Ba'athist regime, which would be the Assad regime counterpart in Syria, but most importantly, it nurtured the Maliki government, giving it resources, training, and so forth, and stepped on the Sadrist movement, Skiri, all the other Shiite contenders. So America, the biggest help was to squelch the Shiite contenders and to help nurture Maliki over eight years. And as soon as he could stand on his own, we... We cut out of there, having spent a trillion dollars or whatever the hell it was, and, and a lot of them people. So we don't want to repeat that. We could do that, but it takes boots on the ground. Otherwise, Iraq would be, you know, full of factions and warlordism today. It could still be in the midst of a terrible civil war. It's almost in a civil war. I mean, every day, 30, 40, 50 people are being killed in car bombs in Iraq. So it's not over. I know.
So 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 in uh, Syria, somebody would have to put, put some boots on the ground. We don't want to. Turkey doesn't want to, and so on and so on and so on. Nobody wants to, and everybody's frightened of the worst case, and nobody has the courage to say, "Hell with it! I'm going to just go in there and throw caution to the winds and pray for the best." And that's what it needs is something because you don't know what the outcome is going to be. It's so easy for us to sit around in our offices and come up with the worst case scenarios that will paralyze you with fear. So nobody does anything. And that's unfortunately what's going to happen to Syria. Why? Because Syria has never been important to America. We've had sanctions on it for over 30 years. Syria has always been a subset of the Arab Israeli conflict for America. It's uh, it's part of it's a subset of Israel, really. And you can see that in the structure, just in the think tanks in Washington, the only think tank in Washington, D.C., that ever hired a Syrianist full time was the Washington, Washington Institute for Near East Policy, which was right. basically started by APAC, right? Indeed. And they're interested in Syria. <laughs> yeah. and they hired a full time Syrianist at a good salary. But that's the only think tank. Now, today, there are others who now, are... Was that Andrew uh, Andrew Tabler? Andrew Tabler. Yeah. Andrew Tabler was lucky enough to get that position because he's a very good Syrianist, and he spent five, six years there, and he needed to find a job, and that's where he could... That's the only place in Washington that was offering a job to a Syrianist. So, and that tells you a lot about the priorities when it comes to Syria in Washington, D.C., Washington's just not interested in Syria. It doesn't trade. We have no trade with Syria. It's not a real oil exporting country. It's, it has a teeny little bit of oil, and it's been decreasing. So it's not. It's only important because we care about its neighbors. Israel, Turkey, Iraq, of course, which we care about less and less every day, and Lebanon to a certain extent because there's an important Lebanese lobby, and we always liked Lebanon. But as long as we can inoculate those countries, and we don't think spillover is too much, most Americans are willing to let Syrians rot in hell. And unfortunately, that's what we see them doing by not making a decision one way or the other to really bring down the Assad regime or to support this opposition. Okay, so this is all uh, this is all thoroughly depressing. Before we go, um, I, wa I, wa <laughs> I want to maybe you can depress me more. Do you think Assad w will use chemical weapons, and if so, under what circumstances? Well, I think he would use them if he's got his back to the wall. But he doesn't. He's a far away from having his back to the wall. He still owns, believes he owns a country, and he does to a certain extent. There is not one major city in Syria that has fallen to rebel hands. About 60% of Aleppo has fallen into rebel hands. But Assad still commands the center of that city. He can bomb. He still has an air force that's flying around the country, bombing at will any town he wants to. So the rebels have to move around. They have to be sneaky. They can hit and run. They have not put together a standing army yet that can really go in and take places. Mm -hmm. That's about to, I think it's going to happen in a not too distant future, but it's still going to be a hard slog getting to Damascus. And so Assad, the moment he uses chemical weapons, he knows that he's got a death warrant on his head. America and Israel both told him, you do that and we're going to mess with you. Mm -hmm. So he understands that he can do pretty much what he wants to up to that point. Now, if he's retreated from Damascus, is in the Alawite Mountains, and militias begin to penetrate the Alamite Mountains, uh, then he might try to use them in order to gain some no negotiating traction and say, look, I'm going to use these. I'm going to kill lots of people unless you, you know, somebody comes in here and guarantees our safety. Mm -hmm. Final question related to that point. Do Iran and or Russia have the leverage to broker a deal that leaves presumably the regime secure somewhere uh, and leaves the Alawites secure and cedes much of the country to the opposition? I mean, are they, A, inclined to do that increasingly, and B, do they, but do they have the, the power to do it? I don't think they have the power to do it at this point. You know, Russia, I think Russia has been looking to promote Alawites, non-Assad Alawites, mm -hmm. who could step in and be an alternative government. Assad has arrested most of those people. If they see them flirting with Russia, he he throws them into jail because he's not going to allow Russia to have the pleasure of being kingmaker in Syria. So, you know, for Iran and Russia, it's still Assad's the only game in town. And the moment they lose him, they're going to lose whatever 
national interests they have in Syria. Mm -hmm. They can still say, like Russia is doing today, oh, we're not betting on Assad. But they may be hoping that Assad, even if he retreats the coast, remains a very powerful force in this land of warlords. Mm -hmm. And therefore, Russia will always have a say, they'll have a client, and they'll have influence and leverage. And that America will have to come to, le to Russia at some point down the road in order to negotiate an outcome for Syria. Um, if they just lay down their arms and they shoot Assad in the head, they may have no more leverage. So we're asking both Iran, we're, you know, we're trying to overturn Iran's government as we're doing this and tell, asking them to negotiate uh, Syria surrender. You can't do that. Um, so of course they're not going to do it. They're going to hang on to every little thread, shred of Syria they have. When you say we're trying to overturn their government, you mean through sanctions and, and possibly covert activity? Yes, no, our national, you know, our national goal is regime change in Iran. Un that. Unstated, but, but, but de facto. Right, well, he, he put $90 million a year marked every year for, to boost the opposition in Iran and to try to get rid of this Islamic state, which we see as a source of evil in the Middle East. It's our biggest enemy in the world. You know, yes, we don't have plans to carry out the regime change today. But I, you know, I think most people in Washington hope that these economic sanctions will bring this regime to its knees and provoke a national uprising in, you know, another green movement or something like that in Iran that will overthrow this government. And that's why else would we be putting crushing sanctions on Iran? Well, there is the, the official rationale, which is largely about the nuclear issue. Um, but the, the nuclear issue is to be solved because this government, we feel that it's about to collapse that there's a national revolt on its hands, and that it has to throw nuclear weapons into the, the trash can in order to prolong itself, uh, in order to survive. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the idea. That's the rationale behind this, and it brings you to the threat of regime change. We want to, you know, weaken the regime to the point where it's throwing off, you know, it's giving away these national things that it considers national treasures. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, all right, so I leave this conversation with no more hope. Well, I don't, you know, we shouldn't be hopeless. Okay, good. Explain that. We see, we see the Syrian opposition getting stronger, getting more organized. We're still far from a unified government. And most people are despairing because the country has been in civil war for two years. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that in four years there won't be something unified. And and it, the opposition has become much more deadly. It's gone stronger every month. There's no not one month in the last two years in which the opposition hasn't made gains. And it's becoming more unified, knock on wood. If that happens, you could come out with some kind of a, a center that could hold. We don't expect it because Lebanon didn't develop that Iraq has, didn't really develop that without boots on the ground. The Palestinians are still split in two, and they haven't held together. So the neighborhood is full of bad examples, and that makes everybody extremely pessimistic. And if you're a, a Middle East watcher like myself, your default mode is always go for pessimism because it almost always is the best bet when you're guessing about the future. But Syria could be the exception um, that surprises us. Well, let's hope, uh, and then and then I hope uh, you'll let you'll let us check back in with you a few months down the road and, and see whether you're, you're really. Well, my pleasure. This is a great show, and I always enjoy it. Yeah, well, me too, and really appreciate you being here. Thanks a lot, Josh. Okay, bye bye.